My name is Lisa, and I am 37 years old. I live with my husband Larry. We both work for the company that my father-in-law founded. Even though my father-in-law has retired, he built a small construction company into a business that makes $300 billion a year. He bought other construction companies, and while he was sometimes tough, everyone admires his great business skills. Larry, who was chosen to follow in his father's footsteps, was raised as a pampered child and has a gentle character. I worry that he isn't strong enough for the tough business world. While being gentle might sound good, in reality, he is very indecisive. I have started to feel he isn't fit to be a husband, let alone a CEO. Larry has even admitted, I'm not cut out to be a CEO. I'll probably just be a figurehead if I become one. It's easier for me that way. He shows no real intention of seriously taking over the company. We've been married for 10 years, and lately, Ephraim frustrated with his lack of initiative. In contrast to Larry, I consider myself to be quite decisive. It seems my father-in-law, during his active years, appreciated this about me and gave me various tasks to do. Before marrying Larry, I worked at a bank, so I am used to managing finances and always think about the numbers while working. When I got married, I quit my job at the bank and planned to become a full-time homemaker. However, my father-in-law asked me to work for the construction company instead. Shortly after I started working, my father-in-law began inviting me to participate in board meetings and asked for my opinion on management matters. At first, the board members seemed skeptical about including the founder's daughter-in-law in important meetings. But as I consistently provided useful insights, they started listening to my suggestions. Although Larry was also a board member, he rarely attended meetings, and this was accepted by the other board members and my father-in-law as normal. When I came home from a meeting one day, I found Larry casually watching TV. Why didn't you attend today's meeting? I asked angrily. You're a key member. You should take it seriously. Without showing any guilt, he replied, even if I go, I don't really understand the discussions. Besides, the board members prefer you, so there's no problem, right? I wondered if he was upset by my involvement in board meetings, though he made such remarks. My father-in-law has been teaching me the details of running the business and seems to be grooming me as a successor. I started enjoying being involved in management, and before I knew it, I was working hard to meet my father-in-law's expectations. About three years after I started attending meetings, my father-in-law retired completely. When there were major decisions to be made, the board members would consult me while Larry was sidelined. I had hoped that being in such a situation would push Larry to work harder, but instead, he became even more disengaged from his work. Although he would come to the office in the morning, he'd disappear somewhere by noon and just stay home for the rest of the day. When he saw me at home, he wouldn't talk about work at all, seeming indifferent to the company's affairs. Meanwhile, my workload at the company was increasing, and I was getting busier. After my father-in-law's retirement, the board members relied on me more and more, and I was given duties similar to a CEO's. Given that we're a large company with many employees, I've been committed to increasing sales and profit for the sake of our workers. With the hard work of our employees, our sales began to grow. I found running the company more interesting and became more engrossed in my work. Conversely, my husband Larry seemed to be losing interest in his work, and his appearances at the company began to diminish. The conversation between us at home had lessened, and our relationship began to become tense. I ran into your sister Nancy today, and we had lunch together, Larry said when he came home. My sister Nancy is three years older than me and had just divorced about four months ago. The cause of her divorce was infidelity on her part, which led to a big commotion when her enraged husband stormed into our parents' home. My husband Larry went to my parents' house to calm down Nancy's husband in my place since I was busy with work. Larry, who had a gentle upbringing and a calming personality, 
managed to convince Nancy's raging husband to leave for the time being. Later, Nancy told me, your husband is really something. He handled my raging husband so effortlessly. She praised Larry. Nancy's husband, in his anger, must have been disarmed by Larry's calm and easygoing demeanor. Nancy was able to divorce her husband after paying alimony, but since this incident, she seemed to look at Larry differently. Until then, she seemed to have thought of Larry, who was not particularly attractive and is indecisive, as just a rich pampered son. But after the incident, she seemed to believe he was a respectable business owner. Nancy, now single after her divorce, probably saw Larry as a great catch as she always loved wealthy men. But I, who was engrossed in work, could not imagine such a thing. Of course, my sister wouldn't have known that Larry is just a nominal executive who doesn't actually manage the company. Nancy's ex-husband was an elite employee of a foreign company and bragged to me at their wedding, my husband is an excellent employee with a high salary, and on top of that, he's handsome. You're jealous, aren't you? Her ex-husband was handsome, smart, and carried a stylish vibe. I couldn't understand why she would cheat on such a wonderful husband. Five months after hearing from Larry that he had lunch with Nancy, I returned home to find Larry unusually serious. Lisa, I have something to discuss, he said. It was the first time I had heard such words from him, and I had a bad feeling. With my heart pounding, I waited for him to speak. Actually, Nancy is pregnant with my child, and I want a divorce, he said. I was shocked by the request for a divorce, but even more surprised to hear that Nancy was pregnant. At a loss for words, Larry continued, Nancy is planning to come over on our next date off to discuss this. So I'm counting on you, he said. I was stunned. I asked him, so you want to marry my sister? With a troubled look, Larry responded, it's not that I want to marry her, but if she's having my baby, I guess I have no choice. I sighed at Larry's typical indecisiveness and replied, well, if she's carrying your baby, I suppose it can't be helped. Let's discuss this when she comes over. It seemed like my husband, and I couldn't make any decisions together. So I decided to meet directly with my sister to figure things out. Even though I had already made up my mind to divorce, I thought I needed to consult my father-in-law about the company's situation. As the daughter-in-law of the founder, I was involved in running the business, but if I divorced, I would become a stranger. The next day, I went to my in-law's house and told my father-in-law exactly what my husband had said. My mother-in-law, who was present, was thrilled that her son had a child, but she quieted down when glared at by my father-in-law. For my mother-in-law, she seemed to be more concerned about her grandchild than the company's management. After some thought, my father-in-law said with a smile, Lisa, I want you to continue to be involved in the company's management as you have been. I don't care about Larry. I'll take the responsibility, so let him do what he likes. It seemed that my father-in-law valued the management of the company more than his son or grandchild. Even though he has retired, my father-in-law, as the founder, still has a strong voice in the company, and most of the company's shares are held by him so there are no executives who go against his will. I was also getting interested in my work and was reluctant to give up now. Now that my job was settled, it was time to discuss the future with my sister. On my day off, my sister came to my house with a big smile and said, Lisa, it's a pity you couldn't have a baby. I'll give you plenty of consolation money. Please leave this house immediately. She said it with a triumphant air. My husband was just silently listening to our conversation, without saying anything, despite being the one who caused the problem. I was appalled at my husband's indifferent face and said, It's okay to get divorced, but there's also the issue of alimony and division of property, so let's bring in a lawyer and decide properly. I never thought you, my sister, would fall for a man like Larry, I retorted to my sister with irony. My sister glared at me with a stern face for a moment, but quickly regained her composure. I finally realized that it's not about looks and men, it's about what's inside. 
It was funny to hear my sister talk as if she fully understood my husband's inner self. Holding back my laughter, I said, that's great, isn't it? From now on, live happily with Larry. The inner self my sister was talking about might be money. She seemed to think my husband was the president of my father-in-law's company, but it didn't seem like she had heard anything from him. When the discussion was over, my sister said she would start living here and brought a moving company. Though I only took out the necessary items, knowing my quick-tempered sister, I had already arranged for a new apartment. I also hired a lawyer and had documents prepared for the division of property and alimony claims. The next day, after moving out my belongings, I started negotiations for alimony and the division of property with my husband and sister, accompanied by my lawyer. My husband was still there, sitting with an indifferent face, and only my sister was speaking. As I said before, I'm willing to pay as much alimony as you want, so please decide at your convenience, my sister said. Hearing my sister's words, my lawyer decided to also claim alimony against my sister in addition to my husband. My sister is still paying alimony in installments to her ex-husband, so my lawyer had said in advance that it might be impossible to claim alimony from her. But since she said she would pay me as much as I wanted, I decided to make a claim. When it came to negotiations about the division of property, my sister excitedly said, This mansion is originally Larry's family's, so it shouldn't be part of the division of property, right? The lawyer answered my sister calmly, This building and the land belong to the company, so it's up to the company to decide. It seemed like even my husband thought this house belonged to his father. Is that so? I thought this house was dad's, he said casually. My sister, on the other hand, was taken aback and confronted the lawyer. Wait a minute, so does that mean I can't live in this house? The lawyer responded in a business-like manner. Since it's company property, you can continue to live here if the company allows it. At this comment, my sister seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, you should have said that earlier. It'll be fine since Larry, the president, will be living here. The lawyer looked surprised for a moment, then burst into laughter. What are you talking about? Lisa is the president, not Larry. Looking at my sister, who planned to remarry my husband, but didn't even know this, made me laugh. She immediately turned to my husband and yelled, Huh, Larry, you're not the president. I stepped in for my husband, who looked troubled, and explained to my sister, Larry is merely an advisor without any executive rights. I'm an executive director, and I was also made president. Our father-in-law, the founder, had always been the president, but when he retired, he made me an executive director and president. The other executives appreciated my performance, and there was no opposition. On the other hand, my husband, thanks to his father's arrangement, was receiving an executive salary as an advisor without executive rights. It's more of a pity than being a mere employee. Even though it's called an executive salary, since he wasn't really doing any work, it was less than what an ordinary employee would get. So I was bearing all the living expenses. My husband, who didn't care about our household finances, didn't even care whether the house he was living in was company-owned or belonged to his father. Although our home was company-owned, my responsible father-in-law had always charged me rent. Though I thought of it as a normal rental property, the lawyer, still laughing, asked me, can we continue to rent this house to Larry? My sister reacted to the rent part of the lawyer's question. What do you mean by rent? Are you suggesting that I take rent from Larry? Isn't it the company's property? Just make it free. The lawyer presented the rent amount laughing heartily at her words. She was shocked to see the figure, and so was her husband Larry, who seemed to be hearing about it for the first time. Guess a house this big does have a high rent. I can't afford that with my salary, he said. His executive compensation would barely leave any money behind if he had to pay that rent. Their living expenses would be hard to cover. During the six years of our marriage, Larry had used up all his modest executive compensation. My salary also disappeared in high rent and living expenses. 
there were hardly any assets left, and splitting the savings was the only way for asset division. After the lawyer left, my sister, who now knew that the mansion she had been hoping for was actually rented, seemed utterly deflated, staring blankly. Larry was grinning as usual. I suggested, why don't you move out and go back to your parents' house? Your mother was so happy about the pregnancy news. Larry agreed, but I couldn't help laughing inside at why I had to consider this man who was about to be my ex. I started worrying if this unreliable man could raise a child, but then I decided it was none of my business. I asked my sister, who seemed to have forgotten about her own alimony, are you okay with the alimony payment, sis? You seemed pretty confident, but you're also paying your ex-husband, right? She was stunned to hear this, her face suddenly snapping back to reality. Alimony? I have to pay it too? She asked, astonished, seemingly having heard nothing of the discussion earlier. You said, I'll give plenty of alimony, but you weren't expecting me to pay it, right? My salary is really low, she continued. Larry and my sister exchanged surprised glances. Watching these two made me want to burst into laughter. I had already obtained signatures on the divorce papers and a lemony request documents. It didn't matter to me, but seeing Larry and my sister like this was pathetic. My ex-husband, who had remarried my sister, had returned to his parents' home just as I had warned. But there seemed to be constant quarrels between my sister and my in-laws. The main cause of the conflict was the lie about my sister being pregnant with my ex-husband's child. His mother, who was hoping for a grandchild, was extremely angry. My father-in-law, who had disliked my sister for stealing his son from me from the very beginning, hadn't even spoken to her. He fronted the alimony for Larry, and I was paid in full. But my sister, seeing this, pleaded with him, Dad, could you please pay my alimony as well? To this, my father-in-law responded, I have no reason to be called dad by you. He was fuming. Not being able to obtain anything she had hoped for, my sister ran away from my ex-husband's family home without a word and went missing. She had practically remarried my ex-husband just to bear the burden of alimony, which was utterly foolish. My ex-husband seemed to consider getting back with me, but his father scolded him. You're the kind of man who should never even think about having a family. You can't even take care of yourself properly. As I watched all this unfold, I reflected on how things had gotten to this point. When Larry first agreed to go back to his parents' house, I knew it was for the best. His mother was thrilled about the baby, but I couldn't shake the feeling that Larry was completely unprepared for the responsibilities of parenthood. His indifferent attitude throughout our marriage hadn't changed, and I doubted it ever would. Seeing my sister's shock when she realized she had to pay alimony was almost comical. She had been so confident, but she clearly hadn't thought things through. Her financial situation was already strained, and adding more payments would only make it worse. I wondered how she could be so naive. The negotiations for a limony and the division of property were surprisingly straightforward. My lawyer was thorough and ensured that everything was handled fairly. Larry and my sister, however, seemed lost and overwhelmed by the process. They exchanged glances of surprise and confusion, making it clear that they hadn't fully grasped the reality of their situation. Moving out of the house was a significant step for me. I had already found a new apartment and made arrangements to start fresh. The house, which I had once thought of as a home, now felt like a burden lifted off my shoulders. It was company property anyway, so leaving it behind felt like shedding the last remnants of my life with Larry. After I moved out, the tension between my sister and my in-laws only grew. The lie about her being pregnant with my ex-husband's child had caused a rift that couldn't be mended. My father-in-law, who had never approved of my sister, was especially vocal in his disapproval. He had always seen her as someone who had disrupted our family, and this latest deception only confirmed his worst fears. My sister's plea for my father-in-law to pay her alimony was met with cold rejection. 
I have no reason to be called dad by you, he said, his anger evident. Her dreams of a carefree life supported by my ex-husband's family crumbled, and she found herself without the support she had expected. Eventually, my sister ran away from my ex-husband's family home without a word. She vanished, leaving behind the chaos she had created. Her attempt to remarry my ex-husband and secure financial stability had backfired spectacularly. She had only succeeded in creating more problems for herself and those around her. My ex-husband, realizing the mess he was in, seemed to consider getting back with me. But his father, ever the voice of reason, scolded him harshly. You're the kind of man who should never even think about having a family. You can even take care of yourself properly, he said. In the end, I moved on from the whole ordeal. I focused on my work and my new life, leaving behind the drama that had consumed my marriage. It was clear that Larry and my sister had their own paths to navigate, and I was no longer a part of their tangled lives. The experience had taught me a lot about trust, responsibility, and the importance of making decisions for oneself. I would never get back with my ex-husband, even if he begged me. I stopped believing in him when he cheated on me with my sister, and I was disgusted by his indifferent attitude during our discussions. He was fired from his executive position and is now working as a temporary employee. The way he behaved during our marriage and after the affair showed me that he was not someone I could rely on or trust. His lack of commitment to our relationship and the company made it clear that he wasn't suited for the responsibilities he had. Seeing him now, reduced from an executive to a temporary employee, only reinforces my decision to move on without him. I've continued being the CEO, which is the most important thing in my life. Running the company gives me a sense of purpose and fulfillment. It keeps me focused and motivated, and I take pride in the work I do. Every day, I strive to make the company better for the sake of our employees and their families. My role as CEO has become central to my identity, and I can't imagine giving it up. I don't even think about remarrying after the breakup. The idea of starting a new relationship doesn't appeal to me right now. I've been through too much emotional turmoil to even consider it. Instead, I want to focus on myself and my career. There's a lot I want to achieve, and I don't want any distractions. I've kept in touch with my father-in-law and get advice from him when needed. He's been a great support through all of this, and his experience and wisdom are invaluable. Whenever I face a difficult decision or need guidance, I can count on him to provide insightful advice. Our relationship has grown stronger, and I appreciate having him as a mentor. For now, I want to focus on the company and think of it as being married to it for the sake of my employees. My commitment to the company is like a marriage. It requires dedication, hard work, and passion. I want to ensure that the business continues to thrive and that our employees have job security and a stable future. Their well-being is important to me, and I take my responsibilities as CEO very seriously. This journey has taught me a lot about resilience and the importance of staying true to oneself. Despite the personal challenges I've faced, I've managed to keep the company on a steady path and even achieve growth. It's not always easy, but knowing that I'm making a positive impact on people's lives keeps me going. In the end, my focus remains on leading the company and supporting my team. I'm determined to build a successful future for all of us. While my personal life has had its ups and downs, my professional life gives me stability and a sense of accomplishment. This is where I find my strength in motivation, and it's where I choose to direct my energy for the foreseeable future.